I'm Deli, everybody. If you're obsessed with true crime documentaries, it may pay off one day. Police say a store owner recognized an Illinois girl who had been abducted years ago because of the latest iteration of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. Here's a little bit of background for you. So Kayla Unbehan was nine years old when her mother, who only had visitation rights, apparently ran off with her while they were supposed to be on a camping trip. Kayla's father, Ryan, had full custody of her when she disappeared in 2017. And fast forward to 2023, when a store owner in Asheville, North Carolina, recognized Kayla from the Unsolved Mysteries reboot. The employee called police and Heather Unbehan was arrested. She's awaiting extradition from North Carolina back to Illinois. Kayla is in protective custody for now and is expected to be reunited with her father. During the years that Kayla was missing, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children shared missing posters that included an age progression. For now, Heather is charged with one count of child abduction. So Terry, now that Kayla has been located, do you think it could be difficult reuniting her with her father? I don't think it's going to be too difficult. They have her in protective custody because they have to determine whether or not the father or any other parental individual is in a position where they can take care of her, both physically, mentally, emotionally. And so we know for a fact she's not going to go back to her mother because obviously her mother abducted her and she's going to be subjected to criminal charges and she may very well be in jail. But one of the things that they do in Illinois is the child, even a minor, can determine where they want to live. So if there are other relatives, she could actually consider some of that. And Illinois will also offer her some sort of counseling because of what she's been through. It's a very traumatic incident and it's a very difficult transition. And Brian, how do abduction charges work when the accused parent had custody of the child at the time and this affect child custody going forward? Yeah, so Jesse, as you said earlier, the father had full custody, the mother had visitation, and while the child may be with the mother at that time, so she has custody of the child at that time, it doesn't really matter, either parent, whether you had full custody or not, the court has said that there are visitation schedules, that they're in the middle of some sort of a family law proceeding, and one parent can't decide for the other parent when they get to see the child. In terms of how this is gonna affect custody going forward, I think this mother might be able might be losing what little custody she has now. She has visitation rights. They could be limited going forward. Maybe she's not gonna have visitation uh, on her own. She has to be supervised by maybe grandma, grandpa, or even the father when she sees the child. Maybe the child can't even go to her home. She has to come to the father's home to see the child or she loses visitation altogether. It's gonna be a horrible mess for her, not just from a family law standpoint, but also criminal. Well, listen, I'm just glad, safe return. Unbelievable story right there. Well, this next story introduces us to an unusual weapon, lunch meat. A Florida officer responded to a smoke shop in a strip mall after the clerk reported a man outside was causing a disturbance. And when the officer tried to talk to the man, things escalated. I called about him causing a disturbance, and he's come in here quite a few times already, and has bothered me and customers, and it makes me very uncomfortable. I was arrested eight months ago, and I spent 18 months in prison, which uh, was not fun. I'm so glad to be out. But anyways, I'm suing the Volusia County Sheriff. I'm suing, this is all with my lawyer, it's currently underway. Uh, what's your question? Just okay. get to that. If I sue the Port Orange of the Police Department and they give me $250,000, that's tax free, right? I have no idea. Okay, I'll have to talk to my accountant about that. Uh, no, she said that she wrote Go much stuff her. up for Go you and you never bought right it. Now. Okay. Go ask her, you okay. Come over here and I'll kick the out of you. Come on. Okay. You, you think I can't you, do it? I know. Don't want to do this. I got a black this. belt, a karate, okay. a black belt, and judo. You understand you're, you're trespassing in the store, correct? Okay. Go ahead, arrest me. Arrest me. Five Central Second Unit, go to. Wait a minute. No, no, no. Put your hands back. Okay, okay. Okay. Put your hands back right now. Oh, uh, this is another lawsuit. I'm suing you for a million, ten million, whatever. And welcome back, everybody. A middle school teacher was suspended and arrested on Friday after authorities say he made terroristic threats to students in his classroom. 46-year-old David Schroeder is a Jewish seventh grade teacher in Grafton, in Grafton, Wisconsin. Authorities say he berated his students after finding a swastika drawn on a notebook in his classroom. According to the criminal complaint, he told the students he had, quote, 17 guns in his basement and that he was not afraid to use them. Other threats reportedly made including sending his daughter to their homes with a baseball bat and wishing pain on them and their families. 
One student from the class told local media that the teacher said swastikas were worse than, quote, writing the N-word on the wall. The teacher was removed from the school when a student reported his behavior to administrators. He's now on leave while the investigation continues. Schroeder faces a felony charge of making terrorist threats and was booked in jail on $10,000 bail. His next hearing is scheduled for June. Let's break it down. So Terry, clearly this teacher overreacted, but what should, be, he, what should he have done you know, under these circumstances? Well, one of the things he has to think about doing is protecting the other students who obviously didn't write the swastika. I mean, they are being bullied in that classroom and he has to find out where that started from. So he can work with the administration, he can talk to the parents and find out how it started. So his job in that classroom is not only to teach, but to protect the students from being bullied. And I agree, this is a very offensive act to write something like this, and it is as offensive as the N-word, particularly to a lot of people. And so I definitely think that, you know, he should have reacted, but the way he reacted was even more offensive to those students students and it probably frightened them and caused more problems than it would have if he had just handled it appropriately. Well, Brian, I mean, he, he overreacted, sure, but, you know, a terrorist threat sounds like a very serious charge. Didn't he just get overly angry and, you know, maybe understandably so, seeing that? Yeah, Jesse, from a legal and factual standpoint, I don't see a terroristic threat. A terroristic threat is often about you trying to coerce a public, coerce the public, a government entity, or even law enforcement to change a policy, uh, politics, uh, actions, or something like that through threats or intimidation. This is just a horrible teacher cursing at a bunch of kids. I, I'm not defending him in any way, shape, or form. From a moral standpoint, he should probably lose his job and never be allowed to, to teach children again. But terroristic threat, that goes a little bit far. I'm not even sure if it's a true threat. I'm thinking about the Supreme Court case, Watts v. United States, where the guy said, if you put a gun in my hands, the first person I'm going to put in my sights is LBJ. That wasn't a threat. So threatening to kill the president, threatening to do this to kids, not a threat. I think it's going to be a tough time for the prosecution. All right. I mean, listen, it's a complicated case and a sad case all around, uh, but we'll continue to follow and see where it goes. When we come back, New York City lawmakers pass a new bill this month preventing discrimination based on height and weight. Up next, we're breaking down the bill's social impact and potential legal implications. Finishing today's show right here in New York City, where council members passed a bill just last week banning discrimination based on people's height and weight. The discrimination ban impacts spaces like housing, employment, and public accommodations. According to a study at Vanderbilt University, women considered to be obese earn more than $5 less per hour than women considered to be of normal weight. The study further shows that among the 40% of U.S. adults considered obese, women of color are the highest demographic facing weight-based discrimination. According to the bill, complaints about weight discrimination would be investigated by the city's Commission on Human Rights. The commission already handles complaints over things like race, gender, and pregnancy. Exemptions to the bill include jobs where weight or height are essential for public health and safety reasons. Seven cities now have similar laws in place, plus the entire state of Michigan. State-level bills have been introduced in New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Jersey. This week, we interviewed two activists about the ongoing problem and the bill's ultimate goal in combating it. When we cite examples of the kinds of discrimination that people face, not talking just about, like, sort of um, interpersonal attitudes about fat, but actually, like, life-changing discrimination, things like being prevented from medical treatment, things like being paid unfairly on your job, things like being, um, you know, treated unfairly by your landlord, those kinds of things. And people kind of go, like, wait, that's okay? Like, that's, that's the law lets you do that? And in fact, the law does let you do that in most places in the United States. Um, you know, people can seek legal recourse anytime they are discriminated against, but it is much easier to have success seeking that recourse if there is a law that explicitly protects you. It's a civil rights issue, and folks should not be discriminated against based on their size. Um, and it also disproportionately impacts certain communities of color. So oftentimes it's sort of this legal loophole of a way that, you know, if you're discriminating based on someone's height and weight, um, you're 
which it's sort of legal loophole to discriminate based on their race as well. And there's continuing research that just demonstrates over and over again that fat is not as mutable as people think it is. Um, but even if it were, is that the world that we want to live in? One where like it's okay to discriminate against people if they could just change that thing? Or um, do we want to be allowed to be who we are and not face legal discrimination because of that. You know, the one piece of criticism that we are hearing about the bill tends to be focused on whether it's gonna create a bunch of lawsuits. And we're, we're, our goal is not actually to see a whole bunch of people get sued over these regulations. Our goal is to see a whole bunch of people make change because they don't wanna be sued over these regulations. So Tara, you handled civil rights cases in the past. Do you think this new law is progress forward? I do think it's progress forward. Look, you have some rights. Obviously, the courts have in both state and federal given rights as far as civil rights are concerned. So race, religion, those are two of the rights that are protected based on a particular description of a group. That has expanded over the years. If you think about it, age is now protected. You have everything from gender to identity that's being protected, whether it's in state or whether it's in federal law. So I think having this societal issue raised is a good thing. And you're going to see over time that there are more issues that are raised, I think, where you don't discriminate. And you heard the experts there talking about why would you discriminate against anybody for any reason? So I think it's a good you know, move forward, and I think we're going to see other areas as well. Well, Brian, this is a New York law, so what do you think is going to happen if it gets challenged all the way to the Supreme Court? What would they do? Justine, let me make sure I'm speaking very carefully and, and not using the wrong words so people come after me for this. But what I think is, if it's a question of whether or not you're going to make height and weight a protected class, as opposed to saying that you shouldn't discriminate based on those two things, which are two different things, because you shouldn't discriminate based on anything, especially height and weight or any immutable uh, characteristic, I think that's one thing. But saying it should be a protected class based on the case law that we have now, uh, going to creating, making gender protected class, sexual orientation a protected class, I think it would take a lot of educating and a lot of putting similar facts as to other groups that are protected um, into the same kind of casing or holding that we have as to why we protect based on race and gender. And I think it's difficult at this standpoint, but maybe with some more stats and education on how weight and height affect people, that yep. could be changed. All right, it's an interesting question. Terry Bryan, thank you so much. Everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on The Daily. We're gonna see you next time as we discuss justice in America.